welcome everybody. It's a sheer delight to welcome again the one and only Efwood Yari. In short, Israel's top Middle East analyst and commentator and the most respected. Our great colleague and uh, genuine friend. We're going through extraordinary times in so many respects, as everyone fully understands. But tonight we're focusing on what the US elections mean for the Middle East and beyond. For Israel, obviously, but for the entire Arab world and all the major non-Arab actors, Iran and Turkey in particular. In short, will President Trump's remarkable Middle East achievements be built on or squandered by the incoming Biden administration? What about a renewed Palestinian track? Is that possible? Will normalization with Arab countries continue and be built on? What's going to happen with the Iran JCPOA nuclear deal? And so many other questions, uh, and many of them, of course, very, very relevant to Australian policy, security, and our national interests. So these and so many more issues, I'm sure, are going to be canvassed by Echwood tonight. Uh, and we're looking forward to lots of questions from our very big and uh, distinguished audience this evening. Echwood, it's over to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, everybody. I will uh, try to fire few uh, bullets of uh, thoughts and uh, attempts to uh, interpret the situation um, as we see it from here and as I get it from uh, our Arab uh, friends and Palestinians. Number one, I think it's very important to, to remember that a Biden administration is a very familiar terrain for everybody certainly for Israel. Uh, they know him well. He goes back with Bibi maybe 30 years. Uh, and some of the other politicians. Uh, he has been here um, uh, quite a few times. And we know the people around him. The same goes for the other players uh, in the Middle East. Everybody knows them. Therefore, the real question, assuming that uh, Biden himself uh, will be mostly uh, engaged in dealing with other issues, the pandemic, uh, China, the US economy, etc., and the Middle East is not going to be one of his priorities, it's very important, in my humble opinion, whom would he choose to be his uh, uh, executives uh, on the Middle Eastern uh, scene? I'll give an example. If uh, Senator Chris Kunz uh, is uh, offered by Biden, they are very close friends, and accepts to be a Secretary of State, uh, that is very different from seeing Susan Rice, ex-Obama, as Secretary of State. This is why people in the region, especially in Israel, are watching very closely the race in Georgia, because these two seats in the Senate will uh, decide if there will be a Republican majority even a minimal major, majority, with a, with a, a, a Senate, uh, with a Republican majority, I don't believe Susan Rice has a chance of getting confirmed. And uh, I don't think we uh, are especially eager to see her in the job. National Security Council, my bet, and I think it's a safe bet, if Tony Blinken wants it, he gets it, he's very close to Biden, very experienced, a very thoughtful, serious uh, diplomat, and if you want, uh, a thinker, intellectual thinker. Uh, we know him well. Uh, he just uh, gave an interview to a, a the Jewish uh, publication in America telling all about the history of his stepfather, uh, uh, saved him from Maidanek uh, uh, camp by 
uh, an American force, uh, etc. Uh, and at the lower level, who would be the Assistant Secretary of State for Near East? Uh, who would be the, uh, uh, the, the who would be the head of the um, Near East Bureau at the National Security Council? Now, without going at, at the moment into names, there are two camps there amongst the Biden uh, operation. And uh, you know, he had 2,000 people on his foreign policy uh, staff during the campaign, no less than 2,000. And about 200 of them are fighting now, really fighting for about 15 meaningful uh, jobs. But generally, we have two camps amongst them. One would like uh, to go back to the, uh, if you want, Obama track and uh, rush towards the resumption of Israeli-Palestinian uh, negotiations, uh, giving this track a priority over uh, building up and the momentum created during uh, Trump's presidency in advancing Israeli-Arab uh, normal, normalization. So I would be watching for, for people like uh, Mara Rudman, Tamara Watts, uh, uh, and others, Rob Mali and others, if they are getting significant jobs that will tell us something about the direction. But I think it's more likely that the more mainstream uh, people of the Biden campaign will end up with the key uh, positions dealing with the Middle East. One example would be, there is a strong chance, I am told, that Michel Flournoy will be Secretary of Defense. We don't see, she doesn't see eye to eye with Bibi and Iran, but she's a great friend of Israel, no doubt about that. Um, where can we see a change uh, during the Biden administration? Uh, again, I think it's very important to remember that Biden is a one-term president. He has committed not to seek another term in 24, which means he's uh, quite uh, free to take decisions, he doesn't have to play to, to, to the gallery, uh, thinking about uh, uh, the next uh, uh, campaign. So number one is Iran. Biden is on record that if uh, uh, the Iranians are willing to go back to compliance on the nuclear deal, uh, then the United States uh, will re-enter the JCPOA. We have to keep in mind, number one, Iran now has 12 times the allowed, allowed by the agreement quantity of enriched uranium. Uh, Iran has uh, introduced uh, new centrifuges, the IR2Ms. IR, uh, it has so far failed in deploying more advanced, faster centrifuges. The Iranians are talking, but didn't get there at the moment about um, uh, re, uh, uh, restarting the heavy water plant in uh, uh, Iraq. And they are moving centrifuges underground uh, in uh, Natanz. I think that anybody who assumes that uh, uh, the return of, uh, a return of the United States uh, to the nuclear agreement fold is going to be smooth and easy is probably uh, wrong. The signs we get from Iran are that they are going to uh, uh, negotiate uh, 
and bargain over every single point. They are not uh, uh, eager to um, move back into full compliance with the, with the clauses of the uh, deal. And they all have in mind that uh, uh, in the middle of next year, they have presidential elections. The presidential elections, which are probably more important than anything, any other elections, presidential elections in Iran in the past, because the uh, revolutionary guards are going to try and install General Hussein Dekan, one of them, ex-minister of defense, as the new president of Iran. That would complete the takeover of the regime by the re revolutionary guards and uh, the demotion of the political power of the religious establishment. And it's very important to them. And anyone one, uh, following uh, the Iranian uh, press these days, a lively, lively, uh, fierce debate going on. What do we do? Do we accept uh, to shake quickly hands with Biden or do we play it tough? My own conclusion, conclusion for whatever it's worth, they are going to play it very tough. In the meantime, we may see um, um, much less daylight between the US and the European uh, partners to the uh, nuclear deal. That would be important. One more point on this, Trump is piling up more and more sanctions on Iran. It's going to continue in the next six weeks or so. He's trying to do it um, under uh, 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 arrangements that they cannot be automatically uh, abrogated by, by uh, a Biden administration. He's trying to make it as difficult as possible for a Biden administration to lift sanctions um, by uh, uh, imposing the new sanctions sort of unrelated to the nuclear deal. Americans who know about the intricate uh, uh, ways of uh, legislation and, and the, the powers in, in Washington are saying to me that probably uh, Trump is deluding himself to think that he can tie the hands of the coming uh, administration from lifting those sanctions that they would like to lift. So let's give it a year. It's not going to happen very fast. The second point is the Palestinians. There is a dramatic change in the Palestinian uh, position. Uh, I think uh, last time that uh, I spoke uh, on uh, AJAC webinar, I was saying that the uh, 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 normalization deals with the UAE, Bahrain, and now Sudan are, will have the Israeli government, whatever government, be more cautious and sensitive and careful in its dealings with the Palestinians, with territory in the West Bank, settlement, etc. But I also said that the Palestinians are beginning to have second thoughts because their strategy didn't work. The Arabs are coming to Israel. So there is an important change in the Palestinian position. Uh, Mr. Abbas has notified uh, the Biden uh, campaign Blinken and Tom Donilon, that he is now willing to resume negotiations with Israel under American auspices. No quartet, no UN, American auspices. 
um, on the basis of what of the uh, 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 point uh, to which the negotiations under John Kerry during Obama's period have reached. Reminder, Abbas has rejected the Kerry outline. And as I'm fond of saying, he told President Obama when he was invited to the White House, I'll get back to you on this, and never did. Now he's, he has informed the Americans, not publicly, that he's willing to go there again. Probably in order to say no after 100 rounds of further negotiations, but he's willing to do that. Parallel to that, he has sent a, an official letter to Bibi, which is also, to the best of my knowledge, may not be in the public domain, but I can, I can say it. And he's asking Bibi a simple question. Does Israel still abide by all the agreements signed with the PLO and the Palestinian Authority? Please answer. He wants Bibi either to say yes, of course, sure, uh, or to uh, be able to uh, illustrate that Israel is shying away from its commitments. He has already approached uh, Bibi, who doesn't have time to for anything now, except his personal issues, the coalition uh, infighting, and the uh, struggle against the pandemic. He has no, no time for anything, believe me. Um, but he has also uh, notified uh, Bibi that he is now graciously willing to accept the three billion shekels that are uh, still uh, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, safes of the Israeli Treasury Ministry. Uh, that is the money uh, customs deducted uh, and it belongs to the Palestinians. They so far refused to take this money because they have, as you remember, declared a policy of uh, boycotting Israel and uh, stopping all uh, contacts and coordination. Now they are coming back. They want the money. If they don't take the money or a good part of it, the Palestinian Authority will not be able to pay salaries in a month or two. Not even the 50% they are uh, 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 paying now. In the background, you see the Palestinians uh, trying to mend fences quietly and slowly with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, and they say nothing against Sudan's decision uh, to normalize. I think Biden's people may find here an opportunity, not necessarily to engage. I mean, it can take place a new round of negotiations over final status settlement. It will never be achieved. But there is a possibility of moving forward and uh, trying to fix Palestinian economy. We have the Abraham Fund with UAE, Israel, and the United States. It has, for starters, $3 billion. You could do a lot with $3 billion to um, change the economic lay of the land in the West Bank. And with the Qataris to do similar things in Gaza. Uh, if this uh, uh, course is chosen by the Americans, that would be very positive. For example, they are talking about 
uh, um, new system of roads, uh, border termi terminals with both, both between the West Bank and Jordan and the West Bank and, and uh, uh, Israel, railway link to the Gulf through the West Bank, etc. Major uh, plans. The third point that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, refer to has to do with the momentum. If Biden and his people, the people he chooses, um, will decide that uh, they can build on the momentum of the Arab-Israeli rapprochement of the uh, last few months, then we have several uh, candidates. One, uh, and please remind me, I don't remember in which lecture I said what, so I don't want to repeat myself, but one is uh, uh, Morocco. Uh, the Moroccans have uh, uh, recently improved their relations with the Gulf states after some minor crisis, and they are willing to move towards normalization with Israel openly, uh, if only the United States will nominate a consul general uh, sitting in the city in the town of El Ayun, capital of Western Sahara. There are already 30 consulates there of other countries. No consul lives there. The rent of the buildings is paid by the Moroccan government because it's all about symbolism, political symbolism. The Moroccans want it. Uh, Trump's people, Jared Kushner, etc., were working on this. It may still happen before January 20th. Second is the Republic of Djibouti, a member of the Arab League. Uh, President Gele, uh, who controls the best port in the Red Sea, six military bases of six nations, including US and China, and France are there. Uh, he's willing, he's waiting for a nod for, from uh, Abu Ali. Abu Ali is a name that I think uh, most of you never heard before. He's probably the most uh, uh, important player in recent months. He's the head of Saudi general intelligence. So if he picks the phone, uh, I think Djibouti will come. And the other one is Oman. Oman is in a um, severe economic crisis now. The people who handled the Israeli-Omani relations since 1978 are no longer in office. There is a new Sultan. But the Omanis are masters of the balancing act. So on the one hand, they are now sort of upgrading their traditional relations with Iran. On the other hand, they may move uh, towards Israel. And then we have Qatar. Qatar, in spite of its close alliance with Turkey and the Muslim Brotherhood, indicates that they don't want to, to wait for Saudi Arabia to normalize with Israel. They would rather do it before. And here we come to the question whether for the Biden team, uh, uh, bridging the or, or or ending the the rift within the JCC, the GCC, the the Gulf uh, uh, Cooperation Council, that is between Qatar on the one side, Bahrain, UAE, and Saudi Arabia on the other hand, whether this is uh, will be a priority. My own feel is that, yes, maybe we, we will see something of this uh, happening. But Qatar is definitely 
a, a candidate for full normalization. Uh, and as you know, it's deeply involved in everything uh, which has to do with Gaza and uh, and uh, 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 Hamas. Um, other than that, no, not to take too too long. Yes, I think that we will see a change uh, towards Turkey. Biden, uh, who visited Iraq 27 years and uh, was an advocate of basically a division of Iraq and the establishment of a Kurdish de facto state uh, is not going to tolerate from Erdogan what Trump uh, was willing to take from him. Uh, it, it's very clear in the reactions of the uh, Turkish uh, uh, political class and the press uh, in Turkey. Um, I will finish by saying this. We are not uh, on to a good start with Biden this time. Today is uh, Thursday. Uh, there was no telephone conversation between Bibi and Biden yet. Uh, Morrison had a conversation I saw. Um, and the reason is that Bibi still thinks that uh, Trump could do a few things in the six, seven weeks uh, remaining. But uh, the relative chilliness uh, in which uh, the Israeli prime minister uh, has uh, uh, reacted to the uh, Biden uh, victory is noticed in Washington and I'm afraid will be remembered. I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Ehud. Uh, and uh, just a reminder to ladies and gentlemen for the question and answer session today, uh, you can use the raise hand feature inside Zoom. So please don't be camera shy, the more hands, the better. And you can use the feature by hitting the participant tab at the bottom of your screen if you're using a desktop or at the top of your screen if you're using a mobile device. And at the bottom of the participant list, you will see the raised hand feature. Now I'll now like to hand over to Ajax V Fleischer. Thanks, uh, thanks Joel, thanks Ahud. Um, I wanna ask about the situation of the Israeli government. We know it's pretty divided, dysfunctional. As you said, Bibi's having to deal with the, his divisions with Gantz all the time. Um, are they able to cooperate sufficiently to deal with the challenges of the US administration? Um, or are we heading to a new election? And would that be a better solution to put Israel to deal with the challenge of a new administration? Uh, it's me, as I said before, I believe, and, and I know you will believe me that I know, the prime minister doesn't, doesn't have the time or the attention to deal with issues outside the domestic uh, problems that he's facing. I am uh, personally uh, involved in uh, building our uh, relations with Sudan for quite a long time. Um, normally, um, I would be easily, it would be easy for me to, you know, uh, alert Bibi to this and that and what should be done and when and by whom and because I'm, I'm in daily contact with the leadership there. Uh, it doesn't have the time. Now, and it's, it, 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 the same goes for the people under him, the head of the National uh, Security Council, Meir Ben Shabbat, our own MBS, we call him, very good man. 
He doesn't have the time. He's dealing with the coronavirus. And Bibi is all the time with the lawyers and, he's in the, and the question of yes or no, having uh, elections, etc. So this moment, I think that the, the, the government that is Bibi is concentrated on what uh, uh, additional advantages uh, Israel can gain from the remaining weeks of Trump. And they will deal with Biden uh, later. Um, I think this is the situation. Thank you, Edward. I'll now, I'll now hand over to Naomi Levine. Hi, Ehud, and thank you very much. I just wanted to raise uh, the recent passing of Saeb Arakat and the implications that will have on the Palestinian Authority. And is there a negotiator who will step in to take his place? He was quite prominent. They are going to divide Saeb Arakat's uh, three portfolios between three people. I've told you in the past in Melbourne or on web webinar that there will be, they, they tend to split estates. So it will be three people getting. Uh, Saeb was uh, secretary general of the PLO and chief of the negotiating uh, uh, team and a member of the central committee of the Fatah. There will be three people taking his jobs. Um, he was not a policymaker. Never. Um, Saeb was a technician uh, with great uh, legal and diplomatic skills who, who knew how to follow orders. Uh, I personally uh, helped him become a journalist many years ago when he was a an editor in the Al-Quds newspaper, the big Palestinian newspaper in East uh, Jerusalem. And I saw him grow. He was, he was a nice gentleman. He was a nice gentleman. But he didn't feel that he's bound to tell the truth. I'll put it like this. Uh, it's not very important. Policy, uh, on, on the Palestinian uh, side is, is uh, determined by one man and one man only, uh, Mr. Mahmoud Abbas. Um, and uh, he's going to nominate the other uh, candidates to, to fill this uh, job. It's, it's, it, it's technical. What is, uh, I should mention though, that uh, uh, the threat of Abbas that he was going to uh, for reconciliation with Hamas, joint lists in elections with Hamas, allowing Hamas back to the West Bank, giving them 42% of the seats in the PLO institutions. This is over. He will never do that under a, a, a Biden administration. Uh, and that's a positive development. Thank you, Ehud. Now over to Jamie Himes. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, um, Ehud. Um, as, as, as we all know, um, Israel has been dealing with Iranian attempts to establish a military presence in Syria and to um, strengthen Hezbollah's missile force in Lebanon. Um, and, you know, there's been a certain amount of of um, thought forbearance from the US government to allow Israel to do that. I'm just wondering if you think a change of government in the US will make Israel's ongoing efforts to do so um, easier or harder or, or won't really affect it. Thanks. Yes, um, this is probably the number one issue from my perspective, because the frequent uh, Israeli attacks on Iranian shipments, installations, militias, you name it, in Syria, did not manage 
did not manage, whatever they write in the Israeli press, did not manage to stop the Iranians. We have uh, workshops producing uh, not many, uh, precision uh, uh, heavy missiles in Lebanon by now. We have the Iranians penetrating most units of the uh, 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 Syrian army now being sort of slowly reconstructed by Russian advisors, but the Iranians are uh, in. And I'll share with you the uh, estimate of at least part of our security establishment. They feel that if we stay on the present uh, uh, course, in two to three years, the Iranians and Hezbollah will be in de facto uh, control of uh, southern Syria bordering with Israel and Jordan. The Russians don't like it, but they are not willing to confront the Iranians. The population in southern uh, Syria, the Sunnis, the Druze, they don't like it but they are unable to stop them. And what we are doing is certainly not enough. So all this talk that we are hearing for a few years now about the war between the wars that Israel is waging in order to prevent uh, Syrian territory from hosting a significant Iranian war machine doesn't really work. We hit them, they have losses, uh, they pay a big price, but it doesn't stop them. And I think one of the, back to your question, one of the main issues probably the, that we need to discuss with the Biden administ administration is how they will try to tie whatever the negotiations they will have on uh, returning to the nuclear deal with the issues of uh, uh, the Iranian activity in Syria and Lebanon. Uh, Iraq too, but that's a big issue uh, on itself. Um, because what Trump did and I remember I said it to you before, what Trump did, Trump left the whole job of uh, 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 confronting the Iranians and to an extent the Russian Air Force in Syria. He left it to Israel as a subcontractor. We were American proxy in this uh, arena. Thank you, Ehud. Next question is for Oved Lubel. Hi, Ayod. Thanks for doing this. Um, so one of our previous speakers, uh, Robert Satloff, suggested a Biden administration would likely call out some of America's uh, less than democratic allies in the region on their poor human rights records. And I just want to know how you think they'll uh, respond to that. Well, I think that the, 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 the Saudis, uh, MBS, and the Egyptians are extremely concerned by the election of Biden. I think they got uh, accustomed to, you know, having a personal relationship with Trump, Jared Kushner, few other people in the White House. They would have frequent telephone talks and make all sorts of quiet arrangements, both the Saudis and the Egyptians. It's not going to work like this anymore. And they know that for that Democrats, what happens on, in terms of human rights, civil liberties in both Egypt and Saudi Arabia uh, is very different from what it was with, with Trump who used to say, uh, they used to say that Sisi, he used to say that Sisi was his favorite dictator. I don't think the Biden and the people around him would have favorite dictators. Uh, so 
some of the warmness in the relations between Washington, Cairo, and, and Riyadh is going to, to be lost. But still, I don't think that the United States will give up uh, its close relations uh, with these two countries. They, it will, may be more reserved. Um, cooperation may be uh, accompanied by criticism and probably even some measures. But it's going to stay uh, uh, in place. Um, the Saudis especially uh, may decide that at one point they will do uh, their own Abraham Accord with Israel uh, as a way to endear themselves themselves to Washington and avoid some of the consequences of the Khashoggi murder, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but yes, it's going to be very different. Thank you, Ehud. Now over to Dr. Ran Parat. Shalom, Ehud. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, host you here at Israel. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about uh, Jordan and uh, the changing of the, the close alliance they had with Trump or with Israel? Is there going to be any change in that arena? Well, I don't think so. Um, there are, if you're watching, uh, if you're following this, there are elections now to the parliament in Jordan. Uh, very few people bothered to go to the ballots. Um, not just because of the pandemic, because they know the parliament will pretty much reflect the king's uh, wishes. Uh, <clears throat> Jordan has uh, managed to uh, get the Saudis to renew some financial aid, which the king uh, 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 needs. Uh, the economic situation is very fragile. Uh, and he has a new prime minister, an uh, effective, capable, younger guy, Bishop Hassaune, uh, with whom he, or through whom he will try, uh, King Abdullah will try to uh, bridge uh, the differences that Jordan had with the uh, Gulf states uh, until uh, uh, recently. Um, much depend on what happens uh, on Jordan's uh, borders. That is, if finally uh, there will be pro-Iranian Syrian troops like core number one, uh, which is responsible for Southern Syria, if core number one will be under the influence of the Iranians sitting on Jordan's border, that's one thing. If the Iraqi uh, Shiite militias sponsored by Iran uh, consolidate their hold on Western Iraq along Jordan's border, and control the desert highway between Amman and Baghdad, it's a different story. This is the, 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 the nightmare uh, of the king. And this exactly is what he will talk to the Biden people about, not about Israel or Palestinians. That's his worry. Thank you, Ehud. Now I'll hand over to Anthony Cohen. You're on, Anthony. Thank you, Ehud. Um, thank you. My question is in two parts. Um, firstly, given that a vast bulk of Arab states, including the Gulf states, um, Eastern Africa, as you've mentioned, 
significant players in North Africa and even with some squeaks coming out of Lebanon. These deals have been made with Israel, it appears, on the basis that America would have its foot on Iraq's neck. Uh, in other words, to keep it in line. And wouldn't it be, on the second part, a bit fanciful to think that the Biden administration, with the squad of four, George Sanders, Nancy Pelosi, Elizabeth Warren, Susan Rice, and a few other players on the extreme left, won't have significant pull over Biden. It certainly will not be favoring those peace deals. I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I agree. Uh, Biden himself and the people around him have uh, uh, welcomed the Abraham Accords uh, in no uh, uncertain uh, terms. Uh, I think they also have an interest uh, to uh, produce, help produce more Arab states normalizing with Israel because amongst other things, as mentioned before, this is going to help with the deal with the Palestinian issue. I think we have to take very seriously what, uh, for example, the Emiratis are saying. At the end, what we do will help the Palestinians. At least we'll help them come to their senses in terms of yes or no compromise uh, uh, with Israel. I believe that uh, uh, the people I mentioned before, as uh, Biden's uh, 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 team on the Middle East, are not going to go easy on Iran. The test is Iraq. Um, I am willing to bet that if Trump is not pulling the American small contingent of American so soldiers from Iraq, Biden, who considers himself as a veteran uh, Iraq expert, will not move them either. I think if Trump doesn't move in a sudden fit, the 2,000 American soldiers controlling northeastern Syria, quarter of the country, with all the oil fields, Biden will not pull them out. What I think we will see is that uh, Biden and his team do not feel that in order to apply pressure on the Iranians or hold them at bay, you ne necessarily need to keep 40, 50,000 American soldiers in the Persian Gulf. You don't need that. And they want to move assets to your area, to the Indo-Pacific. So I think, yes, we may see reduction of American presence in Al Oded uh, Air Base, the biggest, in Qatar, Zafra Air Base in, uh, in, in the UAE, uh, etc. They don't need uh, that much. Uh, but I don't think they will be easy on the Iranians in Iraq or elsewhere in the region. One word about Lebanon. Uh, Without going into the very tricky details of that country now, I'll just say uh, the, 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 the negotiations for uh, uh, the vacation of the maritime economic border between Israel and, and Lebanon is not a technical issue, as uh, Mr. Nasrallah said last night in his uh, weekly speech. In fact, I'm encouraged when he says, it's only technical because it may mean that he will not prevent an agreement. Uh, Trump is, is putting a lot of pressure on Lebanon and Macron, France is doing it in a different way, but not contradictory. I think that if within the next year, we will reach an agreement with Lebanon on demarcation that would be politically, not technically, very important because that means that huge companies like the French Total will start drilling 
very close to the Israeli zone, drilling for gas and oil. And the Israelis will have more companies, Chevron, etc., drilling on our side. And this will mean at least peace at sea. Everybody has interest. Everybody has a stake to, to, to uh, protect. Um, so there is a change in Lebanon. Although Lebanon is now uh, in many ways an empty shell. It's no longer a state. Thank you, Ehud. And now with the final few questions, I'll hand over to Aaron Shapiro. Hello, Ehud. I, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the relationship that's going to, to arise with uh, Netanyahu and Biden, that uh, the, the years, uh, Netanyahu years in his, his second time around has been tough on the American, on the, uh, the relationship between Israel and the Democratic Party in America. The, the polling showed uh, a lot of sympathy for Israel has dissolved. And now uh, they're polling at almost at parity between the ones who sympathize, the Democrats that sympathize with Israel or those that sympathize with the Palestinians, most of them not taking a stand either way. But uh, Netanyahu could have handled his relationship with Obama differently. And we know that what's done is done and what happened happened and there are reasons for that. But do you see a willingness on uh, Netanyahu's part to, to try and, and shore up the bipartisan support in the United States through actions that he can take? Uh, given that, that uh, Biden is coming from a different faction of the Democratic Party that, that Obama was. Of course, <clears throat> of course, Bibi, I don't know how long he, 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 he will be prime minister. But of course, Bibi will, 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 will use his old acquaintance and friendship with Biden, and he knows very well the others, in order to build, once he, he has the time to do that, to try and shore up, rebuild the relationship and hoping to uh, work uh, with the American administration. I, I want to stress what again what I said in the beginning. The people who are most likely to be in charge of Israel, Middle East, etc., are all good friends that we know very, very well. We're, we're not getting a, a set of, of, of enemies, of advers adversaries, most likely. Uh, so uh, I think Bibi's course would be one on the Iranian uh, nuclear issue to try and reach understandings with the Biden team, what would be requested of the Iranians, both in terms of compliance and in terms of the regional activity. This, in my opinion, I wrote a piece about this, it's a must. We need to get to some understanding with the Americans and involve the Gulf and Egypt and others in that too. What what are the demands from Iran? What are the conditions from the Americans uh, stepping back uh, into the, the fold of the JCPOA? For example, the sunset clause. For example, the arms embargo. And many uh, other issues. Uh, the second is for Bibi uh, to uh, 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 try and reach an understanding with the uh, Biden team that the immediate next moves uh, on the Palestinian front is that big, huge economic pa package I was talking or referring to before. And that's a possibility. And the third, to get uh, 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 Biden to have, let's say, Secretary of State Kunz or Tom Donilon, whoever will be in the job, to uh, help other Arab uh, countries uh, uh, reach the decision that they should normalize with Israel. Um, he would do well, uh, but he will not do it, to change his ambassador in Washington. Because Ambassador Dermer, outgoing Ambassador Dermer, 
was thoroughly Republican. And the new guy, ex uh, uh, Home Security Minister Gilad Erdan, in my humble opinion, is not up to the, the job of reviving the friendship with the uh, Democrats. Uh, a top um, politician, diplomat, scholar should be sent to Washington to do that. But as I said, I don't think Bibi is going uh, to do it for um, political uh, considerations. All right, we're wrapping up very soon. We have the two final questions and uh, to kick us off will be Colin. Echoed, it's a bit unfair at this late hour, but getting beyond the Middle East, there's gotta be some continuity, I suspect, in the US policy in two areas, on China and in, uh, in the uh, non-Middle East and Islamic world. And I'm thinking particularly Indonesia where Secretary Pompeo visited just a week or two ago, and you wrote a very interesting article about that relationship. Any comment on how this may affect Israel going forward? Do you see any differences or problems or opportunities on either front? I think Israel, yeah, thanks Colin. I think Israel is um, uh, holding uh, its horses now on China. Uh, The stream of Chinese investments in the Israeli high-tech uh, sector, etc., cetera, uh, has slowed down. And uh, I think the, the, the Chinese are aware of the fact that there are those sectors of the Israeli economy and cyber, etc., that they are not uh, welcoming. Uh, okay, that's the reality, and they understand that our priority is relations where, with the uh, uh, United States. As far as I've heard from them, the Biden people don't see any real problem in a Chinese company uh, managing the port of Haifa or sector of the port of Haifa. They talk about the, the Sixth Fleet will not come visit and is much exaggerated. Uh, you can see everything in the port if you sit on the balcony of the uh, Dan Hotel at the top of uh, Mount Carmel. And Indonesia, uh, there is a, which I couldn't write in that piece, uh, Colin, uh, you referred to, that I wrote with uh, Mike Singh. Um, uh, with Indonesia, we have a more cooperation now than ever before. Um, there is more happening, more frequent uh, uh, visits, more trade, more sales, more, more uh, uh, Muslim and Christian pilgrims uh, coming to Jerusalem, uh, less now, of course, because of the pandemic, there is more uh, uh, happening. But they have made it clear to us and then to uh, Pompeo when he uh, spent one day in, uh, in uh, Indonesia, that they are not going to make the public move of normalizing uh, uh, with Israel. So they will let, uh, at least under Djokovic, they will let the relations grow and develop, but will not wrap it in a diplomatic package of recognition and uh, exchange of embassies. Thank you, Ehud. And now for our final question, for this evening, I'll now hand over to Jeremy Jones. Hello, Ehud. Uh, a question asked specifically from an AJAC perspective. A new American administration, new challenges, different countries trying to uh, direct Biden uh, and the US administration to help what they think of their interests. 
What do you think a country like Australia can do to help steer the new uh, ship of government in America in a way that it will be most constructive in uh, building a better Middle East? I think that the, 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 the main foreign policy priority of the, the incoming administration is the Indo-Pacific, where Australia has a, a role to play. Uh, the Quad, etc., and uh, I think that the Americans are going to move. Not just Obama, one thousand Marines in Darwin. I think the Americans are going to move assets from the Gulf to the Indo-Pacific, uh, and they are seeking partners: Australia, Japan, India, uh, Indonesia, uh, and others. I think this is the area in which Australia can contribute best to um, steering the Americans uh, in the right way, uh, in the right way. Um, I always say that whenever in Washington, I always feel it's very important for the Americans to feel that the two big uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, nations, uh, Australia and Canada, of course the UK too, but Australia and Canada are uh, very close with them, are allied with them. Uh, but here we have an, a, an area, which is uh, the, the struggle for, to prevent Chinese domination of the Indo-Pacific, where it can uh, be really uh, meaningful. And one of the reasons is it will take many years before the Chinese have a blue navy that can really establish presence in the Western Indian Ocean, uh, let's say this. And the reason I'm talking about the Indo-Pacific is that it links to the Red Sea, which I know I've been talking to you uh, uh, in, the pre in the previous uh, webinar. Um, we are building a system in the Red Sea, organization of the states, uh, literal states, it's led by the Saudis, Israel and the UAE will join, maybe observer status, but this system of protecting the um, uh, sea lanes in the Red Sea is should be linked and must be linked to the system in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, it just this morning that for the first time I've learned, although I talk to Sudan every day, few times a day now, that I've learned that the Russians are building a naval base in Sudan on the Red Sea. First time ever. So this kind of multilateral cooperation at sea is, is becoming very, very urgent. Thank you, Ehud, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's all we have time for this evening. On behalf of AJAC, thank you, Ehud, for your brilliant presentation.